everyone, and welcome to episode five of Controllers Up, Cards Down, the all-star gaming podcast. I am one-third of your hosting team this evening, Scott Crawford, coming to you from Swartz Creek, Michigan. Um, and with me, I have two very special guests uh, coming to you. Uh, the... God damn it. <laughs> I'm going to do this again. <laughs> for okay. real. See, this is why I have Heather do the intros. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five of Controllers Up, Cards Down, the all-star gaming podcast. I am one-third of your hosting team this evening, Mr. Scott Crawford, coming to you from Swartz Creek, Michigan. And with me today, I have two very special guests. One of them uh, has two different podcasts, the Psychosemantic Podcast and the VD Clinic. Darren Wilson, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, coming here from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, but, you know, Ohio, Michigan can get along if you don't talk about football, right? That's pretty accurate, yeah. <laughs> and that whole, uh, what, the Battle of Toledo, which I think is where the football rivalry began. But anyway... That's probably more from my show. Uh, thank <laughs> you for having me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you could join us. And we also have another very special guest, Matt Wood from the Eternal Darkness of the Spotless Mind podcast, or Not So Spotless Mind podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Welcome everybody. How are you doing? Hi, thanks for having me. Great, great to be here and great to be with you guys. Legends in the podcasting scene. The fact that you call me a legend just humbles me because, yeah, I never would have ever considered myself a legend ever. <laughs> uh, no, for sure, for sure. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys very much for joining me. Uh, and any of the listeners will notice that uh, Heather cannot make it this uh, on the show today, so she will be joining us in our August episode. Uh, but yeah, I guess we can just kind of get this started, and I'll, uh, we're going to do a little bit of introductions, see uh, the history of where you guys uh, started in gaming. So, Darren, how about you? Uh, any type of gaming, board gaming, video games, whatever. What's your history with it? Okay, let's see. It is a, a checkered past. Uh, <laughs> some some busier years than others. Video game-wise, my dad had uh, something called an Intellivision. Oh, yes. I actually, mm. that's what I started on. Uh, I think that was before or after the Commodore 64, if I've got my chronology right. And you would, you know, there were cartridges and the controllers looked like flat phones. And you would slide the cards that came with the games overward so the different buttons did different things for different games. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember. And, you know, Asteroids, Space Invaders, Burger Time, all that stuff was on there. Uh, it was probably out around the same time as the Atari or something like that. Yeah, I think it um, was. That's that's my vague memory of that. Uh, of course, like every little boy or every young person in the 80s, I asked for a Nintendo for Christmas. I, of course, with my parents, got the Sega Master System. <laughs> my dad said <laughs> that it was better than Nintendo, and I would have friends that had Nintendo. Uh, that was fun. That came with Double Dragon and, nice. you know, the, the 3D <sighs> glasses and the gun game was like missile defense since the 80s in America. Awesome. So you're shooting down nuclear missiles instead of ducks. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it went on to Se Sega Genesis. Um, and then there was a bit of only playing the systems that other people had. Uh, you know, I got more into... Uh, did a lot more playing music and stuff and uh, spent all my money on that <laughs> and stopped getting expensive presents from family members. So I came out on the other end of that with the PlayStation 2. And then I've been an Xbox guy until about three weeks ago when I got my hands on a PlayStation 5. <laughs> Nice. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, uh, arcades, of course. There were a lot of arcade games. Uh, I'm just talking a really long time, so I don't know if you want me to get into board games and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can get into board games. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, but we had, you know, family game game night. A lot of Monopoly, 
stuff like that. And, uh, you know, in high school, a lot of drug related monopoly games. <laughs> um, <laughs> how, how does that work? Uh, there, you know, every time you pass go, you got to do some sort of drink or chugging <laughs> something or, you know, when you're in jail, you probably had to sit there and, you know, smoke some weed, uh, as you do in jail, uh, <laughs> or whatever dumb shit you make up in high school, you know, um, I didn't have the attention span for, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but I used to play a lot of Hero Quest, which was like the Cliff's Notes oh, version, yeah. I feel like. And um, uh, speaking of the band, uh, for the ages, our practice space was in a comic book store. So first time, I never really got into it, but the tabletop games that people play, uh, we had to move to the upstairs part because they didn't want to do it with windows around. They they didn't want the sunlight coming in and fucking up the, the imagination time. So I was like, what the fuck? Why? What's this shit that, you know, is making my band have to move all our gear upstairs? And I checked it. It looked really cool, but way complicated. Um, yes, I've I've played some of those tabletop games. And yeah, they take a lot of uh, either a lot of imagination or just a lot of time, especially if it's like models like Warhammer stuff. Yeah, uh, so many painted models. And, you know, it looked like people that would spend a lot of time and effort. So so I respected it and stopped being annoyed that I had to move all our gear. <laughs> that is fair. Uh Matt, how about you? Um well, I, I used to live in the states um back in the 70s. I used to live in Boston um up until the age of 9. So when I was about 4 or 5, I've got two older brothers um and they went and got the um Atari 2600. You know the original Atari. Nice. Uh, so yeah, I, I you know I was about sort of five at the time, so I kind of grew up playing um, Asteroids, Pitfall, uh, Frogger, uh, all the all the classic Atari games. Uh, uh, you know, and Pong and Tanks and all that all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah, I absolutely loved it. Um, it's been been a part of my life from an early start. Um, and then we moved back to the UK um, in mid '80s uh, or early '80s, um, and over here we had what was called a, um, a ZX Spectrum. I don't know if you had that in the states. I don't think we did. It sounds familiar, but I don't think we had it here in the states. Yeah, it's a, a tiny little computer system, but then the the games would run off a an actual tape, and actually, you know, a cassette tape. So you'd plug that in, and then it would take about an hour hour and a half to load up the bloody game so you know you you plug it in and then you'd go off and play you know i don't know sword fights and stuff for for, for an hour and a half then come back and actually take turns playing the game you know uh so we had one of those um and then commodore 64 um and then i was one of the lucky kids that managed to get a hold of a, an amiga 500 nice um that would be early early 90s 1990 i think we got that um and then through that uh yeah played lots of various different games like eye of the beholder um wrath of nicodemus um quite a lot of yeah sort of dungeons and dragons based games um in in the early years um maybe the odd flight sim um and stuff like that and then uh progress on to um playstation so i had a playstation one two three um and from there obviously uh did a lot of games like resident evil uh being a horror fan that was a, a, an immediate go-to um yep <laughs> A lot of uh, racing games, Gran Turismo, that type of thing. Um, and then moved on. I, I don't know why I made the switch, but it just changed over um, when there was um, the Xbox 360. Oh, so, yeah. I went and got, uh, so I went I got an Xbox 360. I just fancied it change. No, no, I want, you know, there's no preference. It was just, I just fancied a change. 
Um, so I've had a 360 um, and then on, onto the Xbox One. Um, and I'm probably going to get a PlayStation 5 if I can bloody well get hold of one. <laughs> because, well, I'm sure it's the same all around the world, but they're like fucking gold dust around here. Just nothing. There's nothing in stock anywhere. No, um, it's nuts. I, like, because uh, like the story for me, like I, I ended up getting one and I locked out because it was right around the time I got my uh, stimulus check and my buddy just so happened to buy his second PS5. And he was just oh. like, yeah, I bought it for our, for the upstairs of my house. But he's like, I know, like he sent it in our group chat of our buddies that play Magic. And he's like, I know you guys are, uh, I know some of you guys are looking for a PS5. So he's like, I'll sell it to you for re- retail price if any of you are interested. And I'm like, I want it right now. I'll come over right really? now. And oh, grab okay. that shit. <laughs> so you, you've had it a couple of months now, haven't you? Uh, yeah, probably about three months. Haven't had a chance to play too much on it because I'm still waiting for more like PS5 exclusive games. But. And Go plus, on. I'm addicted to another game that I'll be talking about at the end of this uh, in our third okay. segment. <laughs> okay. um, well, computer games and consoles aside, um, again, I mean, when I was about five, uh, one of my brothers introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons, and obviously, it was nice. really, bi- really big in the sort of in the 70s, um, and it's actually making a real big surge again. Um, uh, probably because of lockdown and stuff. But um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I I got into that from an early age. Uh, as I say, I was about five. My brother um, introduced me to that, um, and I always remember saying, "Oh, you should light the light the arrows and fire them at the giant rats." <laughs> 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 They're just one of my early memories. But anyway, so I, I've I've actually played that all my life. Um, I still play it now. Um, I got yeah four, four or five friends all in the UK. We sort of play via uh, Zoom. So it's it's a bit different, um, and that's kind of cool to do by Zoom, though. Well, it is. But I could, it, it doesn't really make that much difference. Um, yeah, it, it's a bit it's a bit slower, uh, pacing wise, because everyone's there's sometimes a bit of a lag and stuff. But it's but it works, and, and we have good fun uh, doing that. Um, so yeah, so I've I've played that a lot. Um, and and just yeah, board games uh, throughout my life. Games like Talisman, yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of kind of um, medieval monstery type games, uh, fantasy stuff. Um, I used to read the fighting fantasy books. I don't know if you oh, get those yes. in the states um, uh, by yep. Ian Livingston and Steve Jackson. Uh, I, I used to collect those and and play those. Um, uh yeah that's about it really um as a as a kind of history um but yeah i've I've got 11 year old daughter now and we we play games and stuff so yeah yeah that's awesome i say i'm glad to see that i got some other D &D loving here because i'm i also used to play the hell out of D. &D. we had uh year long years years long campaigns for some of the the sessions we did and it, we would have like six to seven hour game sessions sometimes. Yeah. It would yeah, just yeah, go yeah. on forever. <laughs> yeah, but no, like, definitely. And especially it was back in the day of uh, the younger teenage Scott. So getting high and playing D&D was always fun. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, um, brilliant. But yeah, now I don't play it nearly as much, but uh, I will be talking about it here shortly with a collaboration that is going on that has me very excited. Um, but yeah, so... Since Heather's not here, I will still ask, uh, ask her questions that she always asks every one of our guests. Uh, we'll start with the, uh, well, uh, Darren, what do you prefer when it comes to video games? Do you prefer digital or physical? I kind of mix and match. Um, uh, one of the games that I'm going to talk about later that I picked for my three all time is one that I that would have me in the school of physical because sometimes they retract a game and if it's in the digital store it's just gone yep. but if you've got yep. that that hard copy backup unless somebody <laughs> scratches the fuck out of your disc you're all right <laughs> uh so it, it kind of depends i i go back like uh i've got about half and half digital yeah, I'd say it's almost an even split, but 
Yep, I, I'll say it's kind of like me too, because I'm, I have like my physical games that I really like the games that I'm so excited for that I've been waiting all year for. I'll go and buy the physical copy, and then, like, if I see just some sales on the PlayStation Store or whatever I'll, for digital, I'll just buy them if they're a good price, and just it gives me an excuse to try games I normally wouldn't play that way. Um, and how about you, Matt? Do you prefer digital or physical? I'm primarily uh, a physical kind of guy. Um, yeah, I'm a bit of a hoarder. Um, I collect <laughs> records, as you can probably see behind me. Um, yeah, I admire I just, your storage for your records. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just, yeah, I just, I like, uh, yeah, I'm a real hoarder <laughs> for stuff. I love stuff. <laughs> um so yeah with with games i've always i've always uh bought hard copies um I, i've always liked the anticipation of knowing oh, i'll be out in a month's time and you know if there's something i particularly want then you know just waiting for that to come out and then actually get it in your hands and racing home and you know getting it uploaded and, and what have you um but I, obviously they are pushing these days towards more digital which, which you know, I can appreciate. Um, some people haven't got the space. People, do, uh, you know, other people don't want to collect stuff. They don't like collecting bits and bobs. Um, and yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I, and I do that occasionally. If there's something, I think, oh, or if they're doing a sale or something new just pops up, then I'll, you know, I'll have that. Um, and obviously, uh, I've uh, got um, Xbox Gold, so obviously you get the you get free downloads anyway so actually there's quite a lot of games um that i have just downloaded through that so i, I suppose it's 50 50 i guess well yeah i suppose it is these days actually in reality but but primarily i've always been more physical yeah i say i'm i think it's just kind of like the, especially in the horror community the collector mentality that we have of like buying physical copies of horror films and stuff like that I think that just kind of just transcends to video games and other physical media. Like we just, it's just nice to have that shelf like to look at and just read Full the of titles. Stuff. Kind of like a, yeah, just kind of like a library in a way. It's, yeah, yeah. It's not nearly as impressive when you just go, "Hey, check out my digital files here on the screen." <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But, but yeah, like at the same time though, I mean, there are a lot of games that are digital only, like a lot of these indie games that come out on Xbox Live or PlayStation Store. So I mean, that's the only way we can get them. So I mean, like you said, they are kind of forcing the digital, but I don't mind that. It's like I, especially for a lot of these these indie games because they're cheaper because they don't have physical copies, which is nice. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, were you raise this on the map? No, oh, no, it was just the only oh. other thing I was gonna, I was going to say was the fact that um, obviously back in the day when you know you're a kid and you're short of cash, you want to take trade in, you know, your hard copies, which obviously you can't do with digital. So, and and, and I think there was a bit of a business built around that. Obviously, um, companies like Game. I don't know. Do you have Game in the states? Oh, we have GameStop. Right. Okay. Well, it's the same sort of thing. So you can take stuff in, and then you get credit to buy newer games if you wanted to go down that route. Um, but yeah, I've I never never sold mine. I kept this little in the loft. I got all sorts, <laughs> of, all sorts of shit up there, so I don't go up there anymore. <laughs> yeah, I I used to trade in everything, consoles, games, and everything back in the day just to get the new one. I regret it so bad now. I wish I would have kept Ouch. all that old stuff. Like, Ouch. I I have everything from the PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 now, because I said, I'm not getting rid of my consoles. I'm going to keep most of my games. But I sold way too much of my older stuff, and I so am kicking myself. <laughs> but that's yeah. that's how I got, that's how I would upgrade, though. That I mean, I had, like, the Sega Genesis with the Sega CD and like 40 some odd games. And I traded that and the entire collection in uh, to a store before GameStop was known as GameStop. It was Funko Land. So I traded it all in there and it bought me a PlayStation 1 with two games because I had so much. So I was like, move me up to the next generation. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, so, yeah, I guess we got to ask this question or Heather might kick my butt. So, uh, Darren. Have you played Echo the Dolphin, and have you beat it? 
I have played it. Uh, it was one of the Sega Genesis games, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. But no, that frustrating fucking dolphin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am not a control thrower, but I I remember Ouch. thinking about it. <laughs> I remember <laughs> thinking about it, trying to beat that game. But I just said, you know what? Fuck you, Echo the Dolphin. And I never <laughs> finished it. I think that is pretty much uh, echoing Heather's sentiment, sentiments. <laughs> uh, how about you, Matt? Uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to throw me into the pits of hell because I haven't played it. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, it's not not uh, a game that I, I've played, unfortunately. Sorry. All right. Yeah. I mean, not everybody has. So it's just uh, I'll say it's just something that she came up with on the first episode that she was so the one game that frustrated the living hell out of her. And so now she it's like just become our thing where we ask every single guest. And she's like, I need to find someone that's beat the game. and We can talk about it and how they did it. <laughs> that's fair enough. I have I have played Demon Souls, though. Oh, and, that, <laughs> and, and yeah, like like Darren. Uh, yeah, throw my console. Uh, fuck this. <laughs> Literally <laughs> go to the top of one tower and that's it. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> I haven't got time to be messing about with that kind of shit. So, yeah, yeah, those games I cannot do because, like, I just don't have the patience. Like, no. I, and it pisses me off because those games look so freaking beautiful and are my type of games, like RPGs, fantasy, horror with Bloodborne. And yeah, it's yeah. just like, I want to buy them, but I know I'm just going to, like, play it once and go, fuck this, and throw the controller down and never go back to it. So I'm like, I'm just staying away. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same. All right. So, uh, I guess we can kind of just jump into the new segment. Uh, I'm only getting, uh, I got three things. One's just going to be a quick uh, update, but uh, Darren had mentioned uh, Cyberpunk 2077 and how sometimes games don't uh, stay on the digital market. Well, Cyberpunk 2077 got removed from the PlayStation Store a while back because of all their issues that they had. It finally got patched up enough to where Sony approved it, and it is now finally back on the store shelves digitally so if anyone is still looking to get the game for the playstation uh it is now available to buy there digitally uh, i think we're still waiting on the ps5 upgrade i don't i think they're just kind of focusing on just performance right now and then we'll eventually get around to the ps5 upgrade to that what what was the, what was the main issue with that um, uh, overall is it just glitches in, in the game or just on on any um on any format yeah i think what it was is they were trying to uh they were trying to release it for playstation 4 xbox one the pro and uh xbox one x and playstation 5 and series x so they were kind of running the gamut of all three plus pc and i think the issue was like for the original playstation 4 and the original xbox one it was almost unplayable like the glitches were so bad or it would just lock up and shut down and freeze up. And like I I had uh, I when I bought it, I had the PlayStation 4 Pro and there were a lot of like weird glitches, but nothing that was game breaking. But it sounded like there was just a lot of broken promises with this game, like with what Cyberpunk was selling to the people and what they delivered. I know Darren's got more time into it than mm. me so i'm gonna i want your opinion on this yeah definitely yeah there there were glitches but like nobody's ever played a glitchy game before it's stuff like floating food up above a table or uh the other day i was playing it and you're in a mental hospital and you know that the person is supposed to be in a wheelchair but it's just some guy pushing a guy that looks like he's sitting <laughs> and just stuff like that. Uh, there, the, well, the that's only, funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just glitchy video game stuff. And since it's cyberpunk and you've got brain implants and all this other shit, I just put all the glitches into malfunctioning hardware in your player's brain. I like yeah. that, actually. <laughs> and yeah. I know some, some people had worse things happen. The only game-breaking thing that... Uh, I had, there was one mission where a guy's supposed to call you to meet him and he'll just call you and not say anything and you can't get him off your screen. 
and you can't save or you know anything so you'd basically just have to restart and they they patched that pretty quick but it, a lot of it seemed like everybody was waiting for it i remember i quote unquote got it for christmas like 2 years ago and it just came out you know this past christmas mm. so i don't know if there was a lot of build up a lot of whatever i mean keanu reeves is in it um but i have uh, i i'll talk about it later because it is one of the games that i'm still playing but the, it's just glitchy video game stuff and i know some people saw had some crashes when the hard drive just too much processing and just restarts the system which sucks but that's only happened to me twice and that's on the ps5 it did not happen on the xbox oh the xbox wow. One. wow yeah so yeah i've uh, anyway um it was mostly floating stuff things out of the way there would be a weird thing where it kind of looked like the happening and people would just stand in the middle of the street with their arms up <laughs> with their arms out and yeah i mean i don't know i've seen bigger companies fuck up more than these I people mean, are getting raked over the coals for but i could have just been lucky but i played it on two systems and yeah i'll I say enjoy. yeah because i because i take your word for it more than a lot of people because you have played a lot more of it and you have played it on the two different systems i played it on the ps4 pro and really didn't have too many issues besides like what i would call bethesda open world style glitches where yeah, uh like somebody's crouching for no reason or, yeah, or yeah. like the one that cracked me up in the game was I was walking down the street and there was someone on a crotch rocket zooming by. All of a sudden he turns sideways and is just riding the motorcycle sideways down the road. Just, just like that. <laughs> yeah. And it's just floating through the air. I'm just kind of like, yeah. huh. <laughs> that's brilliant. I, yeah. yeah, that's that's good fun though. I find that kind of stuff hilarious. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I just laughed my ass off at that one. Yeah. And then, during a mission, there was uh, supposed to be these enemies you're supposed to take out, and one was hiding in an elevator, and I couldn't kill him because he kept falling through the floor of the elevator, then falling through the ceiling, then falling through the floor, and just going over and over and over again. <laughs> so I had to like, just time it and like, take little pop shots every time he'd like, show up for a split second, and eventually, after like 10 minutes, I was able to kill him. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, so yeah, those are like the only serious issues I had, I but... I have almost like video game ADHD where I'll start something and then I'll just move on to something else. So I never really had a chance to focus on that one. Um, but I plan on going back to it. I just now I'm just impatiently waiting for the PS5 upgrade. But uh, yeah, another news piece I wanted to bring up briefly is uh, Ghost of Tsushima Director's Cut is coming out uh, very soon here, which is an amazing game if no one has played it for that was on the PS4. Um, but it is the director's cut is going to be a PS5 upgrade, so you'll have 4K resolution, uh, or the option of 4K resolution or 60 frames per second. Which, either way, that game is just absolutely gorgeous on PS4, so I can't wait to see like 4K resolution on PS5. And it's also going to be coming out with the big expansion for the game. And I guess if you already own it, it is going to be twenty nine ninety nine US uh, dollars uh, if you already own it, and I think if not, then I think it's going to be like sixty or seventy for the in the entire game. But I am excited because that game was just amazing, and if you are into like the old Japanese uh, like samurai movies and stuff like that, they took a lot of cues and did a lot of like nods to that stuff. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. I recommend that game to anyone. Just freaking loved it. Um, but this is where my nerding out segment is gonna be because uh, right now is a uh, spoiler season for Magic: The Gathering's uh, summer set, which is called The Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, and uh, and it's Wizards of the Coast. So of course, Ooh. eventually this had to happen. Magic: The Gathering and D Dungeons and Dragons have combined for uh, this one-time set for Magic the Gathering, and it is literally bringing all of the D&D &D stuff that you know over and turning them into Magic the Gathering cards. So we have, like, the Book of Vile, Darkness, uh, Vile Deeds, uh, or, yeah, the Book of Vile Darkness is an actual artifact in the, in the Magic the Gathering now. 
Um, the Book of Exalted Deeds is another artifact. You got Beholders, you got your Goblins, you got Drider and Drow, Elves, Dwarves, uh, Owl Bears, Gnolls, like all. Brilliant. And, and the part that really just got me excited, because I may not play D&D much anymore, but I am a huge fan of a lot of the Forgotten Realms novels, and they have brought in a lot of the characters from these novels. So you got Driss Duerden with his uh, Black Panther Guinevere. Or Gwendovar, oh, yes. uh, so that he's got his own card. You got Bruinor, the Battle Hammer, uh, got his own card. Um, Icing Death, the white frost dragon that Dritz fought, and uh, I think it was Icewind Dale where he got his Icing Death uh, so, um, scimitar. So, yep, um. there's that. That dragon is uh, a card, and apparently when you kill it, it becomes Icing Death, the scimitar that you can pick up and use with another character, which is freaking awesome. Uh, there's a Dracolich uh, Ebon Death. I forget which book he was from, but I remember him. And they Spellfire? even went. Was that? Spellfire? I think it might be, yeah. Yeah, like. Uh, Maybe. Let's guess. And, uh, what was. Oh, this one came out yesterday, and like I was just like, okay, they are taking some old school references here, because they even went and took. I uh, forget. I think his name's Minsk. But he was a character in Baldur's Gate who had a pet hamster. <laughs> Boo! And Baldur's Gate was with the old school computer video game, and they actually grabbed from that and brought a turned him into a card. And he actually has a separate card for his pet hamster that <laughs> named Boo. <laughs> come Boo, come Boo. <laughs> I thought that was amazing, but yeah, like. Honestly, like, I'm loving the lore and the art and, like, just seeing all these put onto cards. Still not sure if I'm excited for this set or not. I'm probably going to buy the singles just for all my favorite characters just to have them because it's just freaking cool. But this is one of the sets where I'm just kind of feeling just blah about. Like, a lot of the mechanics just don't seem like they're anything too exciting. Can you, can, can you explain how magic magic works? Sorry, I'm, I don't know how, how the game works exactly. I mean, obviously it's a card game and I've seen it about, but I don't know how it works. Just can you give us a brief, for those of us who haven't played it before, like a brief? Hmm. Yeah, I can it's, pretty much it's, it's uh depends on like the format, like, um, but a lot of time for the game that I play, Commander or what is also known as Elder Dragon Highlander, EDH, uh, it's a hundred card deck. You have a commander, which is one of any legendary creature that is legal in Magic the Gathering, and that is like your commander. You put him off to the side, and you can play him anytime, him or her, or it. Uh, you can play that anytime, like, throughout the game, and uh, then you draw seven cards. You have your mana, which is what you need to summon or cast spells. And you pretty much just constantly are filling your hand, drawing cards, trying to cast creatures and cast spells. And it all depends on the color combination you're going with. So it could be if you're a blue mage, you'd be countering spells and like a lot of like just trying to deplete everybody of their resources. So, and, so it's, it's, it's basically like a combat. It's, it's, you're, you're basically combating against uh your fellow players i guess yeah is that yeah. right yeah it's, okay. it can be one versus one one versus four like it all depends on the game but yeah you are basically just like summoning monsters and casting spells to defeat your opponent and there are five di five different colors in the realm in the magic realm so there's blue mana red mana white mana green mana and uh black mana and each color represents something different. Red is extremely aggressive and basically like fire and stuff like that. Blue is like your wizards and mages that can count counter things. Green is just like these giant beasts in the forest that are all about growth and monstrous creatures. Black is about death and the undead. And white is about life and... Uh, Protectors unicorns. like knights and paladins. Yes, <laughs> there are unicorns. <laughs> and, 
and yeah, like, and it 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 gets really in depth because yeah, you can combine the colors and then like those colors do something different together and like yeah, it's there's a lot to it. It's a very strategic game. Like I've talked before about how I was trying to go pro because I would play at a lot of uh, competitive competitions like throughout Michigan and it's there are some people out there that take this game pretty seriously and are just it's incredible seeing what they can do but like yeah I'm I am nowhere near that level anymore <laughs> so now it's okay. just not a casual Thank fun you. I treat it more like a poker night with my buddies just kind of get together have drinks just play all night and then just oh, call it sounds good. good sounds good yeah but it's the I, I think one thing that attracts a lot of people is the artwork and the lore because they actually build up like really awesome stories for each set that comes out like and they actually on wizards of the coast website or magic the gatherings website when a new set comes out they will release like a weekly couple hundred page story and it'll continue like telling story of the characters in this new set that just came out and like what's going on because they they cover different planes and stuff so like it's it's very interesting. They actually put a lot of work into it. Mm, now, sounds, like that, sounds good. Yeah, sounds so good. I'm excited that they're doing this with D&D and that it's a one-off. But yeah, like, yeah, the mechanics, eh, uh, we'll see how it plays out. But right now, I'm just kind of, like, lukewarm on the set. But like I say, just because it's D&D, I'm probably going to buy a bunch of the cards just because I want them in my collection because they're just cool looking. <laughs> yeah, got you. Darren, have you, have you played played that game before? A friend tried to teach me how to play it in high school when I was really stoned, and it didn't <laughs> stick. <laughs> I said, let's go skateboarding, man. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. it, but... Uh, so I, I've seen the cards around, and I have definitely known people that have played it for ages. And uh, Was this the game that people were fighting each other over in this, uh, the box stores? I didn't hear about anything happening at hobby shops or comic book stores, but wasn't there a thing that was coming out with decks, a new deck that people were punching each other at Target over? Or is uh, that not magic? That might be Pokemon. It's hard to tell because I know Pokemon is a lot more like extremely popular because right now a lot of the big retail stores like Walmart, Meyer, and all that stuff, they have... Uh, put all these cards now locked away behind uh like a wall like they would be video games because people were coming <laughs> in and buying them all up as soon as they got put on Bloody shelves or hell. people would start fighting or robbing each other for them jesus <laughs> yeah <Desperate> got, times. <laughs> yeah like all over freaking cards i'm like seriously like all i want to do is walk over grab a couple packs and leave i don't need i don't need to go through the hassle of like trying to like fight somebody for this stuff it's because i <laughs> What it is, especially in Pokemon, I guess there is, I don't know crap about Pokemon. All I know is uh, from the hobby, my hobby shop that I go to, like that there are extremely valuable cards in that set that can be turned around and made, you can make like thousands of dollars. What the hell? Yeah, the hell? so it's, so I can and, see where it's obsession comes from. I was going to say, and when you buy them, do you know what you're buying? Do you know what, what's in the deck or the pack as you buy it, or is it going to be completely random? Uh, it's going to be completely random, at least with Magic the Gathering. Uh, with Magic, I believe, let's see, there's a 15 cards in a pack. Uh, you usually get, well, 15 to 16. There'll be one rare, three uncommons, and uh, 11 common cards. 11 commons are just garbage for the most part. Like, very <laughs> rarely do you get anything that's worth a damn nowadays. And the rare can be a rare or a mythic rare, which is where usually the value can lie. And then you get a foil card, which is like the shiny, like holographic style stuff that you could get with <laughs> cards. And that could be anywhere between a common, uncommon, rare, or mythic. And those can be valuable as well. But yeah, it is just literally like playing the lottery if you're trying to just buy packs for your own just collection. And, and then you get, uh, I suppose you'll have like swapsies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll say lots of trading it. Like a lot of a lot of my buddies, we that's how we build our collection. We'll yeah. we'll buy a bunch of packs, and then if we get duplicates of something we don't want, one of our other buddies will want it. So we'll trade him and get something we want from him, and then just like that's why I like Commander though, because in Commander it's a hundred card deck, but you can only have one of a one of each card. You can't have multiples. So 
when it comes to like when I used to play competitively, we used to play in a set called or a format called standard, which would allow four of a kind in each deck. And that's where shit got expensive because <laughs> you would have to play, like the fifty dollar card. You'd be like, oh, I need four of these. Well, there's two hundred dollars gone just for four freaking cards. Bloody hell. Yikes. Bloody yeah, it, hell. That's one of the reasons I got out of it. I'm like, this is getting way too expensive for me. <laughs> Yikes. That's why I just do ca- like just casual play now because, yeah, just much easier, less stress, <laughs> and less burning a hole in my pocket. Sounds like the right move. Yeah, and, uh, but yeah, I like I said, I'm a D&D nerd, so just seeing this set had me excited, just seeing the spoilers. I've been, I've been reading them every single day when they're announcing new cards, and I'm geeking out and just like, oh my god, this is freaking cool. So, yeah, <laughs> I will definitely be buying some, but I'll probably just be buying singles instead of just random packs like I usually do. <laughs> um, but then I will talk about one more news piece, and that is uh, I'll briefly talk about E3 2021, which happened uh, this month. Um, honestly, from what I watched, I watched the Ubisoft conference, the Microsoft conference, and a bit of the Nintendo Direct conference. This is this E3. I just felt kind of, sort of underwhelmed. Like I was hoping for a lot more big, flashy things with, like you know, the next gen consoles and all that. But a lot of teaser trailers that really didn't give you much. Like, uh, for example, Bethesda came out on uh, Todd Howard from Bethesda came on stage and was talking about uh, Starfield, and he, I thought, since it's been like three or four years since Starfield got mentioned, we'd see some gameplay. We literally get like a minute teaser trailer that shows like in-game graphics, which look absolutely amazing, but I have no idea what this game really is going to be besides if it's sci-fi. I don't know if it's first person, third person, what it's going to be side scroller. I have no freaking clue. Like they didn't give us anything, but they did give a release date of November 11, 2022. So they're further along than I than I thought, but it's I'm still kind of iffy. I want to see more, especially since I'm kind of salty since they're not do they haven't done another Elder Scrolls game since 2011. So I'm a bit salty they have not gave me my Elder Scrolls six yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but then uh, another another game that was on Xbox Series X that I think is going to be an exclusive. Uh, Stalker 2, the uh, old, like, Russian, uh, like, I guess you'd call it survival horror game where it was Ooh. based in Chernobyl. And, oh, my God, this looks so incredibly creepy and just absolutely gorgeous. Like, it, everything they showed, I'm like, this could be real. Like, the, like, these could be actors on a screen like I'm watching a movie. It's almost that realistic now. And... Like I like some of these monsters though just gave me the freaking chills just watching this trailer. Like I I don't own an Xbox, but this made me want to get an Xbox. Wow, that sounds like, good. Yeah, I am very excited to see that game when it finally because I I enjoyed the first Stalker. I didn't play a lot of it because it was on the PC and I only had it for a short amount of time. But it was a very fun, creepy game. Uh, so I was excited to see a sequel to that. And then there was two big name ones that I wanted to bring up from. Uh, the Nintendo Direct, they are releasing, they're finally releasing a new Metroid game called Metroid Dread, and it's back to the old school, like, side-scrolling style of Metroid, uh, just obviously enhanced with uh, faster, like, f- more faster-paced, uh, more, like, cell-shaded style graphics, and so, and it looks like a lot of fun, and, like, looks like old-school Metroid, and they shocked everybody with the release date, which is on my birthday, October 8th of 2021. Hey. So that right around the corner. Uh, and then they showed a uh, about two-minute trailer for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. And, yep, if you were a fan of the first Breath of the Wild, which was, you know, cell-shaded, huge open world, very colorful, very Nintendo-style Zelda game, then this one's for you because it looks a lot more like more of the same probably added added more and enhanced graphics but that's they gave a tentative release date of 2022 for that but honestly those were really the only four games that really caught my attention that i figured i could bring up um 
But yeah, so this E3 to, from, for me felt a little lackluster. Like I'm hoping for more from I'm hoping PlayStation does their state of play soon and like announces some new stuff. Do you, do you think that's because of COVID? I think part of it's because of COVID, and I'm thinking also I might just be old and jaded. <laughs> <laughs> Because, like, I just see a lot of these games, like, because I, I have a hard time getting into a lot of games. And a lot of what Microsoft, a lot of what Microsoft does is a lot of first-person shooters and uh, a lot of, uh, like, focus on Forza Racing and all that stuff. Which, some of those are cool, but not it's not my cup of tea. Um, the part, when it came to E3, that I was always excited about is when Sony was there, because they would... They always had like a very extravagant showing of just like multiple styles of games. And unfortunately, Sony has basically just tossed E3 by the wayside and do their they do their own thing now, which is state of play every three or four months. And they'll basically just get online and show a bunch of stuff they're coming out with. But yeah, I miss the days of Sony being there. Because I am more a PlayStation fanboy, but I am always excited to see what Xbox is doing. And they did pick up a ton of new uh, companies for, like, developers. So, like, they, they have a lot more games in the works. I just don't think they were ready to show them yet. That's fair enough. I was like, because I do hear rumors of a Fable 4 coming out, which I'm excited to see if if and when that does happen. Because Fable is a freaking fun franchise. <laughs> Good game. Good game. Uh, and then, yeah, that is the end of the news. Um, I do have some game releases that I was going to just kind of run down. Um, uh, right off the bat, on July 1st, we have Operation Tango for Xbox Series X, Xbox One. On uh, July 6th, we have A Plague Tale Innocence for PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, and Switch. Uh, Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin coming to Nintendo Switch and PC on July 9th. Where the Heart Leads, uh, coming to PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, July 13th. Akiba's Trip, Hellbound and De- Debriefed, PlayStation 4, Switch and PC, July 20th. Death's Door, Xbox Series X, Xbox One, and PC, July 20th. Monster Harvest, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, PC, on July 20th. Orcs Must Die 3, Xbox Series <laughs> X, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC, July 23rd. Contra returns on iOS and Android July 26. So I'm kind of curious Contra? to see what that'll be like. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Contra for the phone, it seems like. So that could be interesting. I mean, you could probably put the whole NES one on a phone for less memory than Spotify. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it won't take much now. And you, and I think there is ways to do that, too. Um but then we have Microsoft Flight Simulator coming to the Xbox Series X on July 27th. Neo, The World Ends With You, PlayStation 4 and Switch on July 27th. Samurai Warriors 5, Xbox Series X, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC July 27th. The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, PlayStation 4, Switch, PC July 27th. Tribes of Midgard, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, PC July 27th. Near re, uh, near reincarn- reincarnation, iOS and Android on July 28th. The Forgotten City, PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, PC, July 28th. Blaster Master Zero, Xbox Series X, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, PC, July 29th. Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster Series, PC, iOS, and Android on July 29th. And finally, The Ascent. Xbox Series X, Xbox One, PC, uh, comes out July 29th. Um, did not find any board game releases. It's starting to get harder for me to actually find that stuff now. Uh, but I did want to just, since we talked about the spoiler season for Magic the Gathering, uh, Magic the Gathering Adventures in the Forgotten Realms uh, will be released on July 23rd. But yeah, those are all the games Ooh. coming out. I I kind of skipped past some that I didn't recognize because they were probably just some indie games or whatever, but if I had them all written down, we would be here for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that is the end of the intro and news segment. So I guess we can uh, jump on over to the retro table. 
And since uh, Miss Heather is not here, we are not doing the video in arcade top ten because <laughs> it would it just doesn't seem right doing it uh, talking about a Canadian video game TV show without our Canadian queen here. So <laughs> absolutely, yeah. So for this segment, I decided to do something different and figure we just kind of uh, do a top three all time favorite video games like. What just kind of see what each other's tastes are like. So, uh, Darren, how about you go first, and I'll just just talk about all three of the ones that you have on your list. Okay. Um, in no, this one was actually <laughs> a little harder than I could think of because I could come up with the top one from pretty much every console I ever had. Right. So it it was tough to whittle it down. So, you know, honorable mention to about every other year I buy the new NHL uh, hockey <laughs> video game <laughs> since, <laughs> since about 1994, uh, especially as a fan of a team that, eh, you know, they make the playoffs occasionally, but they lose more often than they win in the span <laughs> of their life. You've got to simulate and have them win on your TV every once in a while. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that that aside, uh, uh, the, well, the game that I alluded to earlier was called Manhunt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Made by Rockstar Games. Right. in the early 2000s sometime. Uh, what was that? 2003. I had that on the PlayStation 2. Uh, and, you know, I had the disc and everything. And I I. I don't think I have the disc anymore, but I don't have a PlayStation 2 anymore. But I mean, for those who didn't play it, I think it eventually got taken off the shelves or they stopped. They stopped making it because <laughs> even for Rockstar, it was kind of twisted. And yeah, I, th I think <laughs> this was the uh, game that caused uh, the MPAA to do a AO rating or adults only rating on video games. <laughs> <laughs> they they did not like that game and no uh, it was it was cool it was dark it was kind of like the purge or something well the purge is loud and fast but this was you know you're you're on death row and you think you're gonna die and you wake up and you just have to stealthily kill people with shards of glass or bags <laughs> over their heads and i remember there was a part where i i would always get like beat to death by Nazis and pig masks. Oh, and <laughs> <good Lord. laughs> it's just one of those games that I had to put on the list because I think about it almost every time I sit down to play a game. But like, man, I wish I could play that. <laughs> and I'm not good enough to figure out how to play it on my, you know, get get the file and play it on my computer somehow, like I'm sure people do. But right. yeah, so Manhunt was the the first one you want me to go through my three and then we bounce yeah. from person to person okay uh my second one well I, like i said this isn't really in any sort of order but legend of zelda the ocarina of time oh nice was battling with road rash for my old console they're very different games i don't know if you ever played road rash yeah uh, Matt, I'm not sure if you did. Is it, that, uh, is it we have to mow down people in your car? Basically, uh, you're, you're in a motorcycle, uh, and you fight each other, you know, with hand, melee weapons. It's like, ah, it's like a racing fighting right. game. <laughs> you can pick up a pipe or right. a chain or whatever, you know, that and what, Skitchin was the rollerblading version of that. Oh, yeah. That existed for a minute. But it, I had to give it to Zelda. Because it was, it was you know, kind of open world, which which was fun for the time, or relatively open world. I guess you've got that field that you run around in, and you can pick the sequence that you get to um, do the dungeons and whatever. I know people, a lot of people argue if that or the Super Nintendo version was better, but oh yeah. Yeah, like those two, and oh god, I, you know, see, I'm already doing like a thousand of them. Um, <laughs> okay, I've got a, I've got a, yeah, uh, you know, Conquer's Bad Fur Day was probably my favorite game on the Nintendo 64. Oh, that game! Oh my god, that was so much fun. 
Um, so yeah, that's it. But Conquer's Bed for a Day beats out Legend of Zelda and Road Rash right here live in recording on the show. <laughs> uh, it's all the movie references. Uh, the the Matrix level was a ton of fun, oh, and yep. uh, the Alien level. Uh, did you ever play that, Matt? I didn't. No, no. Oh, uh, it, uh, you're. Uh, it, it came out in the what late nineties, early thousands, or something like that on the Nintendo sixty four, and maybe somewhere else. But you're a squirrel, and you go out drinking with your friends, and you wake up hungover as fuck, and <laughs> Each level, you have to find your girlfriend, but all the levels are kind of like mimicking a movie. There's a, the beginning of Savoring Private Ryan level uh-huh. where you're in the boat and it's just all animal creatures and the teddy bears are Nazis and <laughs> you've got to make it up Normandy Beach. There's you're in the mech machine like Ripley, uh, you know, get away from her, you bitch. And, you, you know, you eat chocolate. You can get drunk in the game. And you sort of stagger <laughs> around, real fucked up, weird. Get a singing pile of shit is one of the bosses. <laughs> um, yeah, so Conquer's Bed for a Day. Uh, every once in a while, I think I still have a Nintendo 64, not from the original times, but you know, when you see it in a shop, he's like, oh, that might be cool to have. Uh, it's in a box in the basement <laughs> for that. Nice. <laughs> it will come out one day. Yeah, uh, remastered. It might even be on... I think you can play it on the Xbox. I I think I have it in a retro uh, collection on my Xbox upstairs. And uh, so third... I, you know, I I haven't been playing it for as long, but the game that kind of got me back into the swing of regularly playing video games was... Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus. Oh, ah, yeah. nice. I mean, I love anything where you fight Nazis, but... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. That yeah. game is such a ton of fun. I think I'm going to have to get it on the PlayStation so I can play it when people aren't around because the Xbox is upstairs in my bedroom. Ah. Yeah, that, that is a very... Like, all of those games are great. Yeah, killing Nazis is, is good fun. <laughs> yeah, oh, so it, good. It's it's my favorite pastime. <laughs> <laughs> and then the people freaking out when it came out, thinking that all the anti-Nazi commercials were about them. It just adds, <laughs> right? adds into that. Oh, oh it just makes it even better. <laughs> uh, Matt, how about you? Um, Well, uh, I'm going to start off with uh, a game called Baldur's Gate. We did mention it earlier. Hey, nice. Um, No, I had this on the PC. Uh, You know, the original version was on the PC. Um, Yeah, it was a game I spent hours and hours playing. It's an RPG set in the Forgotten Realms world. Um, And, yeah, you just sort of build up your characters and decide... Um, as you go along to pick people up and drop characters and stuff, we'll see that there's Minsk with Boo. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> come, Boo. Come. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's just one of those games that I, I could literally sit down and uh play all the way through, and then and then come back again. And then there'll be somebody who'd say, come up with um, literally the locations of all the items, all the magic items and stuff. So I'd spend hours trying to find <laughs> a particular location. It's like in the base of a tree and you <laughs> like on these digits, cause it's all, I don't know how, how it was done, but they were all um, latitude and longitude on the map. And it, oh my God, I used to spend hours trying to find these <laughs> things. Uh, but I did find them all. I actually, one of those games I just spent hours and hours playing. Um, which is now, uh, well, last year, I think, is all been re-released onto Xbox and PlayStation, I think. Um, yeah, I believe give, it has. Give me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, I mean, I'd, yeah, it was just one of those games that I, I played for a long, long time um, back in the day. Uh, what else? Uh, I'm <laughs> I'm a big Grand Theft Auto dude. Um, uh, I mean, I've seen it since the first one which is like i think it was based in london the the original game but when it just suddenly 
took off. Um, I think it was, was it Vice City? I love Vice City. Vice City oh, is so much fun. It was just, it just something else. I mean, at the time, visually, it just blew everything else completely away. And the soundtrack was just, <laughs> it was just bloody <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, oh, Christ. Which, which, which one? Oh, I'm getting confused now. Here we go. Is my brain going into confusion mode? <laughs> hey, which, which one was the one in Miami? Yep, that was uh, Vice City. It was Vice City. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, yep. So that is the one I'm thinking of. Uh, yeah, it was obviously all based around Scarface. Uh, just, <laughs> it was just so bloody good. Um, yeah, it just brings a smile to my face thinking about all the different scenes, jumping around on boats, driving around your car, running people over, shooting prostitutes and all sorts of good fun like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just a classic. Um, yeah, I loved it. Loved it. Um, uh, what else? Uh, and then, yeah, I'm a big fan of the Resident Evil games. Um, I know Venom uh, to- uh, talked very passionately about um, um, 8, uh, yep. the vill- village, Resident Evil Village. Um, but I just want to talk about the original one because it was just, at the time, um, it was so groundbreaking. I think it was PlayStation 1, wasn't it? Um, uh, yes, it was. It was, and I think it was just one of the biggest games of the time. It just, it was so groundbreaking. It was pure horror, uh, mixed in with puzzles, and ah, I just, I love it. Uh, I mean, just remember that going down that corridor, and the uh, and the dogs jumping through the window. Oh my oh, yeah. god! <laughs> just literally uh, lost my bowels as <laughs> <laughs> shit exploded everywhere. <laughs> Uh, just brilliant, brilliant. Such a great game. Um, yeah, just because I think it's one of those games that pretty much everybody played, really. You know? Yep. Yeah, I played it and beat it front to back. I don't even know how many freaking times that game was just so much fun. Well, exactly. And it's been re released. I mean, obviously, you know, you can play it again, and I did do it again through uh, on the Xbox One. But, uh, you know, playing as Jill and, and everybody, uh, yeah. Great, and it's obviously spawned movies and, and all sorts. Great franchise, great franchise. And the fact that it's just continuing, and we have, like, what, ten games total? Like, because we have, like, Code Veronica and other things like that, too. So, yeah, it's like, there's a reason that series is still around. It's 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 a legend in the gaming world yeah. now. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it kind of lost its way in the middle, I think. Yeah. Um. But um, it's good to see that the um, the guys designers are actually bringing it back to its roots. Um, I haven't played um, the the new one. Uh, I'm waiting for so I can get hold of a bloody PlayStation Five first. Uh, but yeah, as soon as I do, that's that's the first game I'll be playing for sure. Yep, I'll say I'm probably going to be grabbing it at some point because Venom kind of convinced me. Because like I've like I've said before, I'm a horror movie nerd, but horror games freak me the hell out. But I think that's just because I'm so invested in being the character that like and it's tons of jump scares so it just i my heart starts racing and i'm going nope can't do it yeah like yeah get your headphones um, on turn the lights off immerse yeah. yourself in it and you <laughs> absolutely yeah you shit yourself it's brilliant yeah i think the only horror games i can do now are like the ones from super massive games like the uh until dawn and dark pictures anthology games because it's basically just a you play as the director of a movie is how I look at it and go, oh, I want this. I don't like this character, so I'm going to make her do the stupidest shit so she gets herself killed by something. <laughs> just like, just I just, I love that kind of like choose your own adventure. And like those ones I can do because it's not nearly as freaky to me because I think I can like pull myself out into like just kind of watch, play it as a movie in my head. Yeah. Where the other yeah, ones feel like I'm like way too immersed. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, for me, I have to. Uh, you could, you'll definitely see kind of a uh, theme with me. I am a huge RPG nerd, so I brought it up earlier, like how I was upset at Bethesda for not giving us an Elder Scrolls Six anytime soon, and that is because Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind is one of my all-time favorite freaking games. I have sunk hundreds of hours into this damn game. Um, <laughs> And it's one of those games where when I first bought it, I bought it on the original Xbox. I played it, was so confused because it 
doesn't really hold your hand at all. And I gave up. I was like, nope, this is this is dumb. I can't do it. Then I find out there is this spell you can make in the game that makes you so you are basically invincible. So I was like, all right, screw it. I'm going to make this spell and then I'm just going to wander the world and just kind of learn the game. And once I started doing that, I was hooked. Like I, I obviously I was a god, so I couldn't die, but I was still just wandering around just trying to find everything because it's, it's like such a massive open world. And yeah. when they tell you to go on a quest, they don't give you no like little quest marker that you can follow and like click on a compass or anything. They'll just be like, all right, so go north, and when you get to this fork in the road, make sure you take the left part of it, or the make sure you go west on the fork. And like they're giving you like legit directions that you got to pull up on your map and read and kind of figure out where you're going as you're walking. And like it, it was a lot more like immersive and realistic, and like it was enough that even though I played as like a god mode style. I went back and started just from scratch without that spell and played it the original way, just to how it was meant to be played. And, oh my God, I had so much fun just wandering and exploring. And the creatures were all just so alien and unique. Like it's not your typical like rats and wolves and orcs and goblins. No, it's like these weird like insectile things that are in caves and, weird half human half octopus monsters <laughs> in the waters that can pull you down really? and like the graphics look ugly as sin like especially compared to nowadays but man does this game just like suck me right in and i i would go and buy i would probably lose a year of my life if i went back and played it again <laughs> just because there's so much to explore really? um and then another one that i wanted to talk about was Kind of from uh, the same Baldur's Gate style of gaming, and that is Neverwinter Nights. Uh-huh. Uh, absolutely love this game from Bioware. Like, it's just, once again, like a top-down perspective, kind of like Baldur's Gate was, and you form a party and you just play, it's literally D&D, so you have, like, your classes and your spells and your attributes and all that stuff, and it just created a very great story and hours and hours and hours of content which i love these massive open world games that i usually never beat because i just get so sidetracked by everything in the game but yeah there's so much to explore so many items to find so many magical things to build and there was one regret in my life where i was uh in the middle of playing a game and my friend shows up because we were getting ready to go somewhere i'm like okay cool and I accidentally saved over my, I was playing a new game and I accidentally saved over my 200 plus hour game when I wasn't paying attention, lost everything. Oh, no. no. <laughs> so <laughs> of course I had to go back and play another 200 hours. Do it all again. <laughs> oh, no. oh, but yeah, it's just one of those games that I could, I just got sucked into and like, yeah, I just, that is when it, that was at the height of my D and D love. So I like was just so in de- in love with a lot of these D and D style games. And the next one is a pretty damn new uh, game for like last generation, I guess would be now. But uh, Red Dead Redemption Two. I yeah, that was a ton of fun. Oh my god, I love this game so much. It is just for one beautiful and like. They went all out with, like, the controls on making you do, like, every little damn thing, which I know a lot of people hated. But I love that they made it that immersive. And, like, the world is huge. The story is great. And I would just get lost and create my own stories in the game. So, like, my character, uh, kind of a dark side story for me, but uh, I found this skull mask that if you put it on, no one knows who you are. So you can get away with like robbing and all that stuff. So I was like, Ooh, this skull mask kind of reminds me of like Chrome skull from the horror films. I'm going to go to one of the vill- the towns late at night and wait for one of the drunks to stumble out of the bar and fought like to slowly stalk him. And he'll like turn around and he starts freaking out going, hey, what are you doing, man? Get away from me. And I start pulling out my knife, put my knife in my pocket, pull my knife out, put it back in my pocket. And so he just starts running. I chase him away from the town, kill him, 
then drag him back and put him in the middle of the town and then walk away and leave for the rest of the night. And every night I would go back to the town and do that. You know, it's not even part of the game. It's just something I created for my character. And I'm going, I really got dark with this shit. <laughs> You're like the serial killer that you try to find in the real game. Yeah, exactly. Is that you? <laughs> yeah, because I got... And I actually, like, that was another thing. I was like, I was pissed when I found out there was another serial killer out there. I'm like, this is my <laughs> turf. <laughs> serial killer? There's a vampire in it? Or somebody that yeah. thinks a vampire? I can't remember. Do you ever come across the random KKK things in the woods at night? Yes. Oh, God, oh yeah. and I killed in every one of them. Fuckers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That like, was fun. And I just got obsessed with just, like, hunting down the animals and, like, trying to find the unique ones and stuff like that, too. Like, they're just... Man, Rockstar knows how to make a game that can distract you for so many times. Yeah, Yeah, there's so many different angles you can go down and get sucked into. It's nuts. And, yeah, yeah, I I look forward to whenever they release Grand Theft Auto 6 or Red Dead 3. Who knows when that'll be. Mm. (laughs) They're still milking GTA 5 for everything it's got, so. Definitely. My Definitely. son got me in so much trouble with Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh-oh. He, he he got up at night and couldn't sleep, and I was in the middle of it. But I was on a horse just riding around. So he's like, oh, that looks fun. Can I try that? I was like, yes. But that's all you can do. So I let him <laughs> ride the horse around for a little while, and then I got him back to bed. But the next day... Guess what, Bobby? Uh-oh. Daddy let me play Red Dead Redemption <laughs> 2 last oh, night. Oh, no. <laughs> Push you right into the bus. Straight under, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> That is fantastic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that is our uh, top three for our retro table. So from here, we will move on to our what we've been playing. Um, and I'll say I'll continue with the rotation that we've been doing. So, Darren, what have you been playing? Well, as as I mentioned earlier, I have been playing a lot of Cyberpunk 2077, uh, sort of getting uh, I'm at the point. I don't know if you know, but there are multiple endings and you can do them all if you want to. Oh, yeah. After you beat after you beat the game, it sort of sends you back to a save point. But the accomplishment has happened. Uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to do all the endings and wait for the DLC. Um, I enjoy the, 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 the net runner builds that you can do. Cause I mean, there's so many first person shooters where you just run around and shoot the fuck out of people. So I get the thing that makes the, the smart guns with the bullets that you can just shoot wherever and they sort of heat seek. And hit the people around the corners, and uh, if you build up your your uh, the computer in your brain enough, you can hack people through walls. So you can nice. just walk up walk up to a building, and do the the ping scan, and then just start taking off people through the walls, and then walk into the <laughs> building and loot all their shit. Uh, so that that that's fun collecting the the hidden cars and motorcycles and talking to Keanu Reeves and I don't know what they're gonna do with the there there have been a couple leaks about possible DLCs I know they they mention the moon quite often in the game mm. so there might be something on there sort of like in uh, well Wolfenstein too don't <laughs> don't you go to outer space for a minute I think you uh, do yeah and stuff so just kind of seeing. Uh, it's one of those games that you can just have have a beverage or have a smoke and just run around the weird city doing weird shit. And the second game, I think I talked about that enough to not bore everybody reiterating everything, <laughs> uh, but if, unless you've got questions. But nope. uh, now that you meant, I was gonna rebuild Man Eater before. Uh, the DLC, the creepy, weird DLC that they've been talking about comes out. But then my copy of Ghost of Tsushima arrived. Ah. And I'm only a couple hours into it, but holy fuck, that game is really right. cool. <laughs> uh, there, I, I like how you could play it in black and white if you yes. want. And you can pick 
Japanese sub or you know in Japanese with English subtitles or overdubs. And I of course don't do the overdub because why would you do that? Uh, yeah, say, I, I totally do it with the uh, sub uh, subtitles. They're so open with their influence from Kurosawa, especially what Seven Samurai mm-hmm. and stuff. It's a really pretty game. I kind of have to remind myself that I'm playing it sometimes. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, it I is like, incredible. Yeah. The guiding wind thing is kind of cool instead of the here's the straight line that you follow to get to the place. Yeah. You, know, you just do that little swipe on the controller and the wind makes the grass bend in the general direction you're supposed to go. Uh, really fun stuff. I got my ass kicked by that giant uh Genghis Khan's son or whatever the Mongol. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you're supposed to actually beat him. No, the, you're but not. I okay. I didn't I didn't know if but you know it was right after that cutscene where they talk about waiting waiting for the moment to strike and as soon as he comes out I'm just, ah! just <laughs> trying to hack him with my sword. So I was like, oh maybe there's a better way that that could go. But it's it's a yeah totally fun game. Um and you said two, right? So I should stop there. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, I was just like, because uh, we're already kind of running a little bit longer than normal. Sorry. But uh, I did want to say, oh, that's all right. I was like, we had a lot to talk about. Um, but that is one thing I wanted to bring up, too, about that uh, director's cut that's coming out. I guess one of the biggest complaints people had when you did the uh, Japanese dialogue with the subtitles is the lip syncing didn't line up because it was still like they were talking in English. Uh, so in the director's mm. cut, they've actually went back through and fixed all the lip syncing to work with the Japanese, which is nice. freaking cool. I was like, that took a lot of time. So, yeah, that's the game is incredible. And I will be going back and replaying the hell out of it here by by the end of summer. I have a feeling. <laughs> uh, so, Matt, how about you? What have you been playing? Um, Well, I, I've been playing a lot of uh <laughs> Call of Duty Warzone. I'm not going to talk about it because I'm sure everyone's pretty much played it. Um, yeah, Call of Duty games, they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, but as my daughter's now 11, she suddenly really got into, in, into uh, computer games, as it were. And we've been playing a game called Toy Box Turbo. Is that right? Yeah, Toy Box Turbo, which is basically a little, a little racing game with, um, uh, you have like, yourself and and your player two which happens to be my daughter and you play against um a couple of other other uh, computer bots you basically race around like these various different courses we literally <laughs> had so much fun playing this game um literally we had to, we would play for like two hours just playing the same thing over and over again <laughs> um it's okay it's just a, like a little racing game it's a bit silly it's a bit a little bit childish almost but uh yeah we just downloaded it on xbox one um and we played that loads um i'm sure you could probably get it cheap out there it is out there on the um xbox one uh but that's what i have been playing a lot of and it's something that's slightly uh on a different tangent something which i have been playing and i always play it and i play it every day this is how sad i am um on my mobile it's a mobile game and it's called Narcos Cartel Wars. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. It's basically, yeah, it's about drug barons, and you basically create an empire, and you go and raid other players, blah, blah, blah. Now, I've been playing this for four years. Oh, <laughs> wow. Bit, I know, but it, it's so sad. I literally, this is the first thing I do. It's my part, of my part of my routine. I wake up with a cup of coffee, and I sit there in bed before I go to work, and I play Narcos for about half an hour a day and i also do it at lunchtime and then when i get in from work it's so sad but the problem is i've got i'm running my own cartel now so i've got to uh yeah ensure that everybody's looked after and then we all go to war and all sorts of stuff um yeah it's it's so bloody addictive i hate the game i hate the fact <laughs> that I'm, I'm stuck playing this game four years on uh my wife hates me for it um <laughs> she's oh you're playing that fucking game aren't you yeah yeah hang on don't don't talk to me i'm just about to attack you know it's just that sad <laughs> uh 
Yeah, so that's Narcos Cartel Wars. Um, if you do want to uh, play it, it is out there on iOS and stuff. Um, hey, you can even join my cartel. So go and find Freebase 40 and join my cartel. But there you go. <laughs> yeah, I'll say if you spent four want, years um... building the Empire, so don't fuck about. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and yeah, if you want, uh, if there's like a like friend uh gamer tag or whatever that you want we can share it in the facebook page group so people could join you if they want yeah, yeah sounds good sounds good uh so yeah i guess i will uh talk about what i've been playing well it's gonna be kind of a repeat of last episode because i have been sucked into freaking valheim i i think in the last month i have put in over a hundred something hours into this damn game <laughs> My, uh, my, our occasional co-host Tim, uh, who is also my roommate, uh, him and I have been playing it together, which is probably the reason why I've been so addicted to it. Because I don't think I'd be playing it that often on my own. But he ended up creating a dedicated server, so where it's just basically our world, and we can have up to ten players in this world. Um, right now we have like me and him and. Two of our other friends that occasionally jump on, but uh, we want to like put the dedicated server information out there on our Facebook page and everything. So if people want to join us, they can uh, request to, and we can allow them into our world. Because I'll tell you what, this game is. I've never played a game where sitting there chopping wood, farming food, and just building bases is considered fun. But somehow I can spend hours. Yeah, I'll say I last night I spent six hours and all we did is we ran to a we ran to a crypt out in the swamp biome, fought some skeletons and undead, got some found some iron ore, took that back to our base. And then for the next two hours, just sat there and fed it into a smelter to turn it into iron bars so we could upgrade (laughs) our weapons and to create a forge and all this other stuff (laughs) and then after that i ran out into the woods and chopped down trees and just kept chopping down trees (laughs) and bringing all the wood back to the place so i can continue building my base and just the i will say the building in this game is like very impressive because uh you actually have to take in uh mind uh structural integrity so like if you're building with wood, you can make like a two-story building, but you may have an issue with the roof collapsing if you do not have enough support beams. So you got to place things in there, and you got to watch because it'll start. The uh, pieces will turn from blue to green to yellow to orange and to red. Once it hits red, if you attach anything else to it, it'll all just like those those pieces will collapse, and you got to rebuild oh, it. God. Like. Luckily, you did, the whole building doesn't collapse, so and you, the, you don't lose the material, so it's only those two pieces. So you just got to get very creative on how to make things stay supported or just redo it. I got we ended up finally getting to the point where we can build like stones, so like we can make like castles now. But it's I got a little too ambitious with the base I built. It's uh, pretty freaking large and. <laughs> I ran into a lot of issues trying to build the roof, and it took me like three or four real life days of playing the game trying oh to like figure out how to get it to work correctly. Because you can't really do much if you don't have a roof. You can't sleep in the place. You can't because uh, you need shelter, and they don't consider a floor above your head shelter. They only consider actual roofing as shelter. But finally got it done. And now I'm in the process of like decorating it, making it just like my own. And <laughs> but Come on, so it sounds all encompassing. It sounds like a oh. game you could just literally lose your life to. Sorry, oh, everybody, you're not going to see me for the next next year or so. Yeah, and this is another reason why I have not been watching a lot of movies at home lately because I've just been sucked into this damn thing. Like, and I'll like I said, I could go out and plant carrots, carrots and turnips and farm them. <laughs> to make stews because food is very important in the game to make your character stronger and able to com- uh, be able to uh, survive like fighting some of these monsters that are out in the world because uh, you got to deal with trolls that may occasionally show up and try smashing your base and these trolls are like three stories tall and 
they're just absolutely frightening while you're trying to defend and how I even you can even tame wild animals so I tamed some wild boars and now I got a boar farm where they're like breeding and I'm killing them to get their material and then they'll breed some more and it's just it's insane like I I I don't know how they did it but this game is just like simplistic in its idea but it's just like there's just so much to it that it, it's it, and it's just a six person team from Sweden that made this game. Yeah. And and like yeah, eat they created it to where anybody that creates their own server, their world is gonna look completely different than ours. So they'll have different uh areas like closer to them or further away from them than us. And it's and they're constantly updating it and adding new stuff. It is uh in I think I called it, it was an alpha mode last time. I was wrong. It's early access is what I meant to say when I talked about it last episode. But yeah, they're continuously updating and fixing things. They're adding new things. They're adding new building materials and new farming stuff. What's, what's it available on? What format's it on? Uh, it is on the PC. Oh, it's PC. Okay. Yep. Uh, I got it through Steam. Right, okay. But yeah, like I'm... And we're not even, like, even halfway through, like, where we can be in the world. Because there's, like, I think six different biomes, and we are in the third biome. So there's the meadows, the black forest, swamps, uh, mountains, plains, and the mistlands. And the mistlands are a new biome that hasn't been... You can go there, but there's nothing there. Like, they're still adding stuff to that one. But, like, right now, we are working through our, our way through the swamps and the next step is the mountains where we got to figure out how to stay warm because it's snowing and everything like that and we take damage if we go there without any proper warm clothing <laughs> very good very good that nah, sounds awesome sounds awesome yeah i'll say hopefully i'll have a new game to talk about in the next episode but we'll see how much further valheim sucks my ass in <laughs> <laughs> do you uh, probably but... quite enjoyed the camp chores in red dead redemption too didn't you Oh, I carrying did. buckets of water and the chopping wood and <laughs> all that. Collecting the meat. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think it's just the immersion of just doing mundane activities in a video game. It's just, it, it's something I wouldn't do at home, but at the same time, like, it's something that's just like, I don't mind it at all. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, but yeah, that'll wrap up uh, episode number five of Controllers Up, Cards Down, the All-Star Gaming Podcast. So before I let you guys go, I want you all to uh, give a shout out to your podcast that you are on and uh, any other social media platforms you want to share or what or gamer tags or anything like that. Uh, so, Darren, feel free to plug your stuff. OK, let's see. In reverse alphabetical order, since I try to switch it up. Uh, you can find me on the VD Clinic podcast uh, with my podcasting partner, Vanessa. Um, we do mostly film, but an occasional TV show here and there. Most often paired with a reading of some sort. Uh, uh, this is coming out probably around the time in the next few weeks or a month or so we will be visiting the next installment of the boys series and nice. doing some of the comic book and we yeah we just had out uh our pride episode pride of chucky vanessa always picks our pride episodes and so that was seed of chucky and bride of chucky and oh i can't that. wait to listen to that cool. uh that's vd clinic pod uh, you know, don't search for pod if you need the medical advice. And <laughs> I'll probably 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 retire that joke at some point. Uh, and then also I have the Psychosemantic podcast. That's me and random guests. I try to do two episodes a month, but since I have to pick find somebody and pick the topic, sometimes it's just one episode a month. But uh, that is Psychosemantic, one word. Unless uh, on Twitter, somebody's got that name. So it's at political movies on Twitter. But that's, you know, politics, movies and political movies. We it's not as boring politics as people might think. But I don't think everybody thinks that. But I know some people have said that to me. It's more uh, trying to examine 
the sociopolitical themes in a film, but there's something in pretty much any genre. Uh, we just did uh, Bowling for Columbine not too nice. long ago. I uh, got my gun having but non-gun fetishist friend lance from the horror returns <laughs> uh on there to oh, talk with me <laughs> about that stuff and uh just, just other things like that lots of cross genre stuff um a little less a- anyway sorry ramble 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 <laughs> psycho semantic vd clinic pod I think that's all I'm on. You can also catch me like half of the other podcasters in our circle on the summer series on the podcast under the stairs. I am on 2010 and 2014. Nice. Matt, how about nice. you? Well, uh, yeah, you can catch me on the eternal darkness of not to spot this minds podcast with my co-host Kate Pollock. Uh, where we talk about horror movies and listen to Kate talk about random nonsense. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Whilst I get drunk and mumble nonsense myself. Um, So, yeah, that's it, really. Um, What else is out there? Um, That's it. (laughs) Um, All right. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, uh, I'm on Xbox One and um, Squid Monkey Zero is my gamer tag, so if you want to join in or do something to give us a holler squid monkey zero i love that <laughs> thank you all right so and uh as always you can uh catch me and my lovely co-host heather powell on the friday nightmares podcast under the kill the cast banner and we are on we are on the legion podcast network uh our last up ep- our latest episode we just dropped was uh Horror at the Beach, where we discuss four different horror films based at the beach, uh, because we love to do summer-themed style, and we are going to be doing our next episode is going to be based on lake house horror, because if we're going to go with the beach and water, why might as well go to the freshwater style and well and talk about those horror films. Um, We also just released uh, on Legion Patreon our top five Canadian horror films, where we had Christian... And uh, Vince from TGIF 13, the Friday the 13th fan podcast, uh, join us. Uh, I was the one lonely American amongst the sea of Canadians on that episode. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But that was a really fun one. Uh, It should be, uh, by the time this episode is released, that episode from Patreon should be put on our regular feed as well. Um, But yeah, we have a few other things uh, coming up and then... We will be taking a small little break during the summer. Uh, the next episode of Controllers Up, Cards Down may not be until mid to late August, uh, just because of my life and vacation time and all that. It's going to be tough to get around to recording. Uh, but yeah, that. Uh, thank you guys very much for joining us, joining me on this episode. This was a freaking blast. Uh, glad to yeah. finally work with you, Matt and Darren. As always, thank you. It's such a yeah, great Matt. time working with you. Cheers, guys. Yeah, likewise. Uh, So, yeah, thank you, guys. And uh, until next time, uh, controllers down, cards up, power off. (laughs) 